ghost in the machine today, I guess. <laughs> well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. Welcome. Whether you're here in person or online, we welcome you here today into God's presence because that's actually what's going on here today. We are here with God through the Holy Spirit, joined together into his presence. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a beautiful day outside today compared to what you guys had last week. I, I, I can't say anything because I was in Atlanta all week and we had 70 degrees and thunderstorms and tornadoes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane. <laughs> My, <laughs> well, this uh, this week begins our Lenten season, and uh, this Wednesday we'll be having an Ash Wednesday service here at 7 o'clock p.m., and uh, we'll be starting our new uh, study, which will be on Max Locato. We've got some study guides back there. If we need some more, I'll have to get some ordered quick, uh, because this is a brand new study that uh, officially launches on the 23rd. So um, I've got some friends that got us all the materials ahead of time, and so uh, this is a brand new study from him in the footsteps of the Savior. So what it does is he takes us through Jesus' teaching in the Holy Land. So all of the videos and everything we see are from the Holy Land so to kind of give us a better grounded experience of uh, what this means and what the cultural aspects of it were. So we do have some study guides in the back back there coming up. We have men's breakfast, and we have a brand new uh, griddle out here, so we're going to be cooking some sausages and pancakes and those kind of things. And don't worry, Denny, biscuits and gravy will still be here, <laughs> so we'll have that coming on. That's going to be March 4th at 9 o'clock. Yeah, I have a riot on uh, So March 4th, 9 o'clock a.m. right here, we convert this over into a nice area that we can meet and discuss things, and we have some pretty good discussions that go on. Uh, Gray Street Cinema is going to be returning in March as well, and uh, we have details on that. We're trying to get some licensing information on one of the movies that we'd like to show. Um, I already have the movie ordered. Um, it was released, I think it gets released on the 23rd as well. Um, but we have to get the licensing information in order to be able to publicly show that. So as soon as they get back to us, then we can try and get that going. Orange Track Racing, believe it or not, uh, comes up again on March 11th. So we have that coming on. Uh, that's always a good time. We had a lot of uh, neat cars here, some really strange looking cars here this last time. I never knew that they made a car that looks like a slinky. And, and it's a slinky car, so it's, it's kind of fun. And then on April 1st, and this is no kidding, we have the Iron Sharpens Irons Men's Conference down in Davenport. So we're trying to get that group uh, scheduled. We we have, uh, what, until the end of the week to get our tickets on that one? Uh, it's in? actually into March. Yeah. Okay, into <coughs> March? Oh, in, awesome. Into March, like halfway through March. So we're still okay. good. Okay, we're in still good shape, great. So anyway, that's what we got coming up. So we got a lot of fun things coming our way. Uh, Stephen Kendrick is going to be one of the key speakers, as well as Joe Martin. Stephen is one of the Kendrick brothers, uh, who we've shown a whole bunch of their movies here. Uh, and so they, they do a lot of great faith-based Christian films there. Um, oh, I guess I should have held this up earlier, but here's a little study. Uh, so the Kendrick brothers, um, we've got... I think six or eight of the films in our library back here. Uh, so if anybody would like to check any of those out and take a look at them, bring them back. Um, that way we can kind of pass them around. Uh, should be in good shape. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? And open up this time of worship. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this time to be together, to be gathered together freely and openly as believers in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we have this family here together together today as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit to come in and join with us this morning in worship. Open up our hearts, Lord, to receive your message in. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders and blessings and glory of your world. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to live out 
uh, what you are teaching us here today as we go back into the world after the service. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Terry's call to worship today comes from Proverbs uh, 3, 5, and 6. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not depend upon your own understanding. Seek his will in all that you do, and he will show you with path, which path to take. And uh, as I was having my quiet time this morning, no kidding, I opened up the Bible, and guess what it's on? Proverbs 3. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, but what I'd like to tell you in the, my study notes here, it says, in order for God to make straight one's paths, a person must be doing whatever he or she already knows to be right. And I thought that was a neat point. Obedient and uh, obedience activates God's promises and to depend on one's own understanding of truth and life means to disregard God's will. And I thought that was a big one in there because you don't usually hear that. Uh, standing on our own understanding, taking our word against God. So what we're doing is we're saying, God, you can't handle this. I'm going to do this on my own. And uh, so I thought it was really interesting in the study verses in there where it talked about that. And you have to think about when we look at this verse, because this is one of the most widely quoted verses in the Bible. When we look at this verse, we have to think about how often in life we're led astray with our thoughts and our actions by no other persons uh, involved in it but our own. So leaning on our own understanding and discounting what God had, setting God's will off to the side and following ourselves. So the writer in Proverbs here is, today is telling us that we are all fallible in our thinking and understanding of any given situation that we might face. And so we should look to God instead to provide the answer so that we make that good decision and stay on track with God's will for our life. And to do that, it takes discipline and hard work. It's not an easy thing for us to do, setting our own will aside. Because as we're brought up, we're, we're taught to kind of depend upon ourselves, to, to look upon ourselves, to draw strength, your inner strength. But truly, we need to look to God and draw on his strength. His strength is never ending. Ours taps out. I, I got home Friday night, and I got to tell you, I was tapped out. You know, I couldn't think straight or anything. It was 13 and a half hour drive. And it was a great illustration of how I can't do this on my own. But God's will is never ending. His strength is never ending. His love is never ending. We need to depend upon God in all that we do. And when we do that, then our faith will overcome any kind of fear, any kind of trepidation that would stand in our way would be cast aside through that faith, through that trust in God and through God inviting God into the, our situation he dispels fear and so when we think about it when we're so consumed with worry and fear and doubt it's because we haven't gone to God first in that situation so I can't wait to hear what Pastor Sari, uh, Terry has prepared for us today in this message that, that we have and uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, a neat thing that uh, I was kind of perusing his message this morning as I was loading it up back there for our online service. And uh, it's called Battling Fear. And I think we all have to take a good hard look at that as we go through each and every day of our lives. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as uh, we prepare to hear the message that Terry has for us this morning, Lord, just... Uh, uh, calm his nerves and calm his fears and put your Holy Spirit in charge today. Let us feel your presence in this room as he gives us the message that you laid upon his heart to relate to us today. And Lord, the most important thing is let us take it to heart. Let us live it out and let us put it into practice yet today. Thank you, God, that we have this opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Fear is a, a mindset that we often face. Now, Wednesday, uh, 
had the opportunity to have a, a nice long chat and I was here alone at the end of everything and I was turning everything down and I used the restroom down the hall and I came back out here and something said you just double check that back door so our, our new wooden door back there in the kitchen I checked it and just as I reached for the handle I hear this weird sound and then a banging on the door to say that I didn't get struck with a fear would be an understatement. You know how your body all of a sudden goes into that tingling and then you just, I, I jumped back. And then immediately cast whatever was there in Jesus name away. And the, the sound went away and the bang. Now, Mark and I had talked this morning about this, and we're going to re-anoint the doors. <laughs> because and I knew whatever was there was not going to get in, because this is God's space. I feel safe in this space. Whenever I'm here alone, I feel safe. When we were downtown, with everything that goes on downtown, I felt safe in that space. That's whatever God is, we can feel safe and God is everywhere so we can feel safe but here's the thing that mindset it's too often it becomes our norm we become fearful of the things that are going on we become fearful of uh, what is our our spouse or our better half or girlfriend boyfriend what are they thinking uh, did I do something wrong and that's a, there's some insecurity that goes with those thoughts but or you go to work and it's like, am I going to get yelled at for this or for that? Or did I do this wrong? Or did I do that wrong? And so that fear, it, it just is almost comes, becomes a, a permanent part of our lives. And dare I say that it, it's almost like a soothing feeling when we feel that fear. And, and when I say that, I think of people who like horror movies. I can't stand them. I won't watch them. I won't even watch the trailers to them. And I was really sad to hear that they have now taken Winnie the Pooh and made a horror movie. So, point in, so we all experience fear in some form or fashion. For some, that those types of movies they don't even phase. In fact, there's been you know parody horror movies that come out and. I forget what the uh, insurance company is, but they make fun of the horror movies and the kids are running around and they run into the garage and there's, you know, the chainsaws are all there. And it's like, oh, we gotta hide. It's like, um, hello, but I digress. As followers of Jesus, here's the good news. We are given tools. They're given tools to battle that fear. Fear does not have to win. In fact, in today's message, it is my prayer that you'll come away with some practical tips to win against the battle that fear is waging in our lives. This message is going to be filled with just practical tips that help us to take the steps to win that battle. Now, whether times are good, bad, or difficult, we must think about the things that we are feeding our minds with. So what are, what are we ingesting into our minds? What are we watching on TV? What are the movies that we're going to? What are the books that we're reading? What are the things that the people around us are doing? What are we seeing on social media? How are we reacting with other people? Because when we do that, there's a lot of things that are coming at us. And we have to be prepared for whatever is coming our way. If we're not prepared, we are going to be overloaded with fear and negative. And well, actually, we're going to start. We're going to be filled with negativity. Fear is born out of negativity, and as so as we take all that in, we become start to become fearful. And while we can do the best that we can do personally. It's not enough, and it never will be enough. But by faith, we have to let go and let God handle the 
the rest. Now Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And I want you to just remember that last portion of that. Things we cannot see. Because what happened to me Wednesday night, I could not see. If I had opened the door, there would have been nothing there. There was nothing. But regardless of what we might think, though, nothing surprises God. God wasn't surprised that that happened. God's not surprised that that happened because he knew it was going to happen. He knew I was going to take the sermon that I had started that was going to have a like a pre-Lenten Ash Wednesday type message to it and had me put it to the side and said, no, I know as much as that's what you, because mm -hmm. I spent hours preparing, getting ready for that. He said, no, no, this is where we need to spend our time this week. So what happens when things go beyond our reach and we feel like we've lost control? Our minds start racing with the, all those what if, you ask those what if questions to yourself, what if I'd have done this? What if I'd have done that? If I'd have done this, would that have happened? And you can play that game all day long, and you're never going to win. Because the past has already been, gone past. You can learn from your mistakes, but the what ifs, they're just going to take control of your mind. And then those what if questions lead to fearful thoughts. What if I do it again? So then you start looking from past to future what ifs. You can't live in those what ifs. Now I work all week long. Well, if this doesn't fix it, what then? We cross that bridge when it comes. We have to trust the process and we have to trust in God. And when our minds start racing with these fearful thoughts and before we know it, we start to think irrationally and we start to act irrationally. Go back to, I like this book. <laughs> it's good news. That's where we can come back to. Scripture can help to guide our thoughts by testing whether or not we should even think about something. That's going to be the first thing we're going to talk about. What we should do with those thoughts. So let's look at Philippians 4. Verse 8, and this is from the New International Version, and those words might be yellow for a reason, so pay attention to this. Finally, brothers and sisters, what, and I love this one, this version of it, because I always thought of it as the whatever verse. <laughs> we actually had given the girls something that said whatever at one time, and it was based on this verse. So, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So let's break those down. Let's look at these. I might I just leave that up there. True. One of the most important things that we need to consider about our thoughts are, is this true? Is this thought true? Or is it just something my mind is racing with and trying to confused me with. It's the evil one trying to use those thoughts to you know, he likes to put his foot in the door and be like a door jam. Keep that door open so he can get in. So we need to focus on that. We need to focus on what is authentic and what is real. Next word, noble. Because we are children of God, we possess outstanding qualities. Remember what it said in Genesis, we are created in his image. And Mark said it before, and I've said it before, God don't make no junk. And if we're all created in his image, then there's nothing wrong with us. We are not junk. And our thoughts should be royal and should be regal because we are made in his image. We are made in the image of the king. And what do we know about royalty? If you are part of the family, you are royalty. So we need to act and have our thoughts be that way. 
Now let's not allow ourselves to think in an unkind, and we see this all over social media and all over the place now, and you can even buy t-shirts, they say, be kind. That's all they say on it, be kind. So we need to not think in unkind or repulsive ways, because that can take us down a very dark path. The next word, word whatever is right. Thinking the right thoughts means allowing accuracy and appropriateness to guide us. If we're thinking the things that are in this book, if we are being led and guided by the things in this book which are right, then we are headed down the right path. And we are called by the words in this book, God's word, to right living and right thinking. Then we have whatever is pure. Pure in heart and thought is not as difficult as it might seem. It just means that we need to choose to think about good things, upright things, and honest things. Whatever is lovely. To think lovely thoughts means to see the beauty in life and allow our minds to think upon those things. When we look out, you know, I can still see because of the leaves not being on the trees branches that are broken you know some there's one tree over here you can see it about halfway up there's like two or three different pieces coming up that are snip that were snapped <coughs> off but what happens in a few months in a well, few weeks <laughs> when those trees start to bud that will all get filled in and we'll see beauty again god is able to make take things that like that and make them beautiful Whatever is admirable. Now, people want to be admired. We want to be admired for doing things. We want to be popular or we want to be looked at. We don't want to be bullied. Marissa was over. Uh, she had stopped down to her brother's down in Davenport to say goodbye to Pearl, who was a 15-year-old dog that they had had when she was growing up. Pearl was going to be put down that day. But we got to talking somehow about, oh, I said, I hear you're getting a new superintendent. One of the superintendents from uh, one of the school districts north of here is going to Webster City. And she was talking about the middle school, which Ashland's going to be going to, and how the bullying is awful, just absolutely awful. And I got to talking, I said, I was bullied. But here's the thing, the bullying is the same type of bullying. But it's like with social media and everything else, the volume has been cranked all the way up. If that existed today, would my thoughts have remained lovely and pure and right and noble and admirable? Or would I have been driven to a point even though I knew Jesus, would I have been driven to a point where I would have considered taking my own life? We want to have good thoughts. We want to have admirable thoughts. We want our thoughts to be such that they can be considered commendable. We don't want to have those, those awful thoughts. Next, whatever is excellent. The best of the best is what excellence is. Excellence in our thought lives leads to excellence in our lives. It translates from our thoughts to our actual lives. And then whatever, anything that is praiseworthy. What thoughts are worthy of praise? I mentioned this last week, and it's still going on. Asbury University's revival is still going on. They have four indoor locations where this is happening. The main chapel area, and they're broadcasting it into three other buildings, and now they're out of room. They have literally put screens in on the lawn, and now thousands of people are on the lawn, and people are coming from around the world. Here's the thing. They just interviewed 
1970 graduate of Asbury Seminary, which is across the road, separate, a little bit separated from the college. And he saw what was going on over there, so he went over there, and he said, I was just, wow. And so he ran back over, because it was lunchtime at the seminary, and he told them all, and he was so excited at the work of the Holy Spirit, and only four people he said, it's happening again. People are coming from around the world. They interviewed on uh, Tucker Carlson the other night, the um, student body president. And she's just dumbfounded by what's going on. I mean, she just is uh, giving all praise and glory to God. And then they called the school and said, can we come? And the school said, don't come. Elevation Worship said, can we come and sing? And they said, no. Because what is happening is praiseworthy. It's not, they're not, uh, if you walk into the, the, onto the grounds of the school, no one is selling anything. When you walk into the buildings, they have tables laid out with snacks. No one is selling anything. This is a pure work of the Lord. There's no big screens. There's no fancy worship band. It's a piano, a guitar, and a beatbox. And kids are, these kids are switching on and off, and it's constantly going. This has been going on since chapel ended at 11 a.m. the week, a week and a half ago. It started a week ago, went this past Wednesday. These are the things that are praiseworthy. They are focusing on God. They're focusing on His ways, His plan, and His creation. And it's safe to say that their thoughts are on Now, this is spreading beyond that. Lee University and there's a couple of, and there's other universities across the nation where this kind of revival is breaking out. Praiseworthy revival. And it's happening with the kids that the older generations were ready to write off. And it's not, it, it, they're, they're, pushing away all of the outside influences and they want to make it praiseworthy. They want to make it about them. So what happens when we do like that? When, what happens when we test our thoughts and, and use these guides and our circumstances that don't change? Have you prayed to God before and it didn't change? When you paid attention to these words from this verse and things don't change? That's where faith enters in. We don't know the future, but thank God he does. He is already there. He has already prepared it for us. He sees and knows our future because he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and he is everywhere at all times. Uh, something we can't even wrap our minds around. In fact, guess what? He sees you. He sees you. He sees you. 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 He sees all of us. He sees you guys. He sees you that are watching online. He sees us all in all parts of our lives. And he is with you. And to put it this way, he's got you. Even when you can't sense him being there, he's got you. There, we have to trust in that. Now, I'm not a mind reader, but I can imagine there's at least one of you out there that's thinking there's no way to adjust our thoughts 100% to be all of these things, right? And you're right, we can. But isn't some improvement better than no improvement? I mean. We've used this analogy before. How do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. So how can we win this mental war on fear? One thought at a time. One verse at a time. And 
that's quite the challenge sometimes, especially when it feels like we are being com constantly bombarded by fear, just constant. And you want to overcome it. You said you might, it's like, Lord, I'm tired of this. I, I, help me. It, but it's hard. We just talked about how we can determine whether or not to think about things and other, whether they fall into those pieces from that purpose. But do you do this? Do you stare at your problem and just focus on your problem and then just glance at God? You just give God a parting glance or a parting shot in this problem? Or, or are you giving it all to Him? See, we have the order wrong. We need to be gazing at God and just giving a side eye or a glance at our problems. Because when we focus on God, our problems will be taken care of. Now, how was he going to take care of that? Sometimes he's going to take care of it supernaturally. Sometimes he's going to put someone in your path to walk that problem with you, to walk life with you. Sometimes it's a matter of putting a doctor in your way. Diane's hand, her wrist has been getting worse and worse, and it's right now I know it's numb. She can't sleep. If she can't sleep, now she can't think. And we've been praying to God for the healing. But I know that if he doesn't just supernaturally reach down and touch her wrist and, and heal it, then this Friday when she goes to the surgeon, he's gonna, that surgeon's gonna use his God-given abilities to take care of the problem. We're staring at God instead of the problem. But it's hard when you're worn down by it. When we do that, when we focus on God and not on our problems, our lives will definitely be better. Hebrews 12 is a great reminder for us when we think about faith. Are we spending our energy focused on the trials and struggles in front of us, or are we focused on the God who is over all of them? Hebrews 12, 1 and 3 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides, beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Verse 2 says, keeping our eyes on Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. So here's three questions for you. And these are three questions uh, to determine where your thoughts are directed. Is my focus on my circumstance or on God? Do I worry about my struggles or do I trust God? Am I feeding into my fear with those awful what if questions? Here's the thing, I don't need to remind you that we live in a fallen world. So we are still going to battle worldly desires. Our sinful nature will allow us to drift towards worldly things because we think they may feel good or may feel better and that they're easier. I hear it all the time, I know Mark hears it all the time, but if I give up the world, and accept Jesus, he's going to take all my fun away. Guilty. 
until the day that Jesus called me to my knees. And when he did that, and I started focusing on him, those things that I thought were fun, that I thought I could was getting a fulfillment out of, I was shown that they were just nothing. They were a waste of time. And I was shown a whole new world of things to focus on, to capture what I was doing, such as spending time. Even after 20 years of being, since I was called to warfare, my mind still will roam to unpredictable things and to the uncertainty that life brings. That is when I'm reminded to look to Jesus. And when we do, our minds will not stay focused on our problems and our situations. So don't give up. Galatians 6, 9 says, so, let, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Tell God that you are choosing Him and that you trust in Him. And we've tested our thoughts. And we've talked about changing where we gaze. Now we're going to talk about preparing for battle each and every day. How many of you say a prayer as soon as you get up in the morning? Before you even get out of bed, help me, Father, not to sin today. Help me to follow you. Help me to look towards you and to do the things that you have called me to do, to meet your divine appointment. to us in Ephesians 6, and we're going to start with verses 10 and 12, where it says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. That was Wednesday night. In order for us to withstand the attacks, we have to depend on God's strength by using every piece of his armor. And we're going to talk about that here in a moment. But verse 12 here is important because it calls out what we are fighting against. We are fighting against an unseen, dark and powerful enemy that we too often will not admit exists. It's the same argument that people who don't want to believe in God will say, I can't see him, but I don't think it exists. Well, he does. And so does Satan. And too often, we forget that it's going to take God's supernatural power to defeat that enemy. It's not anything that we can do ourselves. Fear is Satan's playground. Thankfully, we have a plan of attack, and God has given us a spiritual dress code. So let's look at verses 13 and 17. It says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We have to be fully equipped with the 
belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, and a prayerful heart. Just as important as the armor of God is that prayerful heart. That next verse in here, from verse 18, where it says, Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Praying at all times doesn't. People think prayer has to be this long, drawn-out thing. You know, we, we read in the scriptures how not to be like the Pharisees who had their prayer boxes and they would stand on the street corner and for everybody to see. In fact, a long time ago, I, I started doing one word or one sentence prayers based on whatever was coming at me, whatever I was doing at that moment. So we can make a quick, uh, or a habit of quick, brief prayers. Another is when we design our lives around God's desires and teachings. So think about this. When we live the way that God has called us to, our life, our very life, the very things that we do in our lives, become a, an unspoken prayer. This can help us so that we don't live that life of fear. Once we're appropriately clothed and living our prayer life, then we can heed the words of James, Jesus' half-brother. This comes from James 4, verse 7. This is the New Century Version. It says, So give yourselves completely to God. Stand against the devil, and the devil will run from you. When you invoke Jesus' name, Satan leaves. Unfortunately, sometimes when he leaves, he leaves a path of destruction in his wake because of what happened before that. But before we can start rebuking or resisting the devil, we have to ask ourselves the following question. Have I fully surrendered and submitted to God? This is an important piece of that. Have I fully surrendered and submitted to God? Because submitting to God means that we are fully abandoning our worldly lives and giving our lives to Him. It's when we have the armor of God in place and prayer in our heart that we are ready to surrender and submit to God and His ultimate authority. And in doing so, then we are given the strength to resist when that happens, Satan flees. Now, problems will arise from trying to do it through our own power. How often, if you've read this, the scriptures, but Lord, we cast out demons in your name. But they had not fully surrendered and submitted to God. And what do we hear in the scripture? Go away for I do not. Resisting the devil is hard, and it is absolutely impossible without submitting everything to God. But here's the thing. If we, if we submit to God, we surrender to God, in that same act, we are rebuking Satan by doing that. So we're doing two things at once. So now we have a foundation. Let's take the final steps in removing Satan's power over us. And this ties back to a, a series that we did here a while back called Predecide. And that series we talked about making decisions before a moment arises. That we would, uh, the tag for it was actually better choices, better lives. So that is what I'm asking you to do today is to predecide, be prepared beforehand. I think. I just automatically go to my Boy Scouts, be prepared motto. Before troubling times make their way with this, 
we pre-decide and we are prepared, we will have a course of action already set up. And then we can fully trust God, even if we don't see that next step. The best way to come against fear is to speak God's word. So we're going to take the following verses and we are going to turn them into declarations with prayer. Psalm 119, verse 105 from the King James Version says this, Thy lamp is a lamp, or thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now I read all kinds of different versions of this, but because this is the version that I grew up with, it's the only one that felt like was going to make sense to me. So that's why I used it. So let's pray. Lord, light the path that you have for me. When I'm afraid, remind me that you are by my side and give me your strength. Help me to trust in you and to know that you will lead me through the darkness with your light. The next passage is our call to worship passage, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 from the New Living Translation, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding, and seek His will in all you do, and He will show you which path to take. And pray this, God, help me to trust you with all my heart and to not depend on my own understanding. I give to you every area, every aspect of my life, acknowledging you in every single situation. I believe in you, and I trust you to show me the path to take. Romans 12, 2, from the Passion Translation, puts this verse this way, Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in His eyes. God, help me to not copy the behavior of this world, to leave the ideals and the opinions of the culture around me, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind through your Holy Spirit. Then, then I'll be able to know your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Back to Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. God, with your help, I will think about what is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5, from the New Century Version says this, We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. We destroy people's arguments and every proud thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Colossians 3, 2 from the English Standard Version says, Set your minds on things that are above and not things that are on earth. God, set our minds on the things of you and not of the, not of the world, not of our culture, not of the, all the influences around us, but solely on you, Father. 2 Timothy verses verse 1 7 from the Amplified Bible says this for God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline abilities that result in a calm well-balanced mind and self-control God you didn't give me a spirit of timidity cowardice or fear but one of power one of love one of sound judgment and personal discipline. Father, let me use those and remember that you have given them to me. And finally, from 1 Peter 5, 7, the New Living Translation, 
Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. God, I cast all my anxiety upon you because you care for me. These are not prayers or verses that are meant for one-time use. These are prayers and verses that are meant for daily use. Use them throughout the day. Fear does not loosen its grip on us. We have to go into battle for our freedom and a freedom that we only get through Jesus. Next part. You don't feel like praying? You don't feel like talking to God? You don't feel like reading your Bible? Do it anyway. A little blunt, but do it anyway. Pray. Talk to God. Sometimes it's not going to be a, a nice little prayer like this. You're going to be crying out to God saying, why God? Think, think about Job. Why did you, you allow me to be born if this is going to be what happened? He was honest and he was raw with God. And we can be too. But we also have to remember to give him the praise and honor and glory that he deserves. And yeah, after reading the Bible daily, praying once, you might not feel anything different. Keep doing it. Keep praying. Keep reading. Sometimes I will open my Bible and I will do my daily reading and I don't get anything from it. So do I stop halfway through? No. I keep going. I keep reading. And then I pray and then guess what happens? Maybe not then, maybe not later that day, maybe not later that week, but two weeks down the road, God will say, remember that passage I had you read? Let's talk. And he brings to mind that passage or that, that uh, devotional that I was doing, and it begins to start to make sense. So we need to read, and we need to pray again, and again, and again. I think you keep going with that, but you get the point. can't just be praying when we need it. We have to be praying all the time. Our prayer must be without ceasing. And remember how we do that. You can speak those words, but by living our life the way that God wants us to, we will be a prayer through our actions. Father, we know fear is real. It is dangerous. It can direct us down so many paths. Father, remind us to come back to you all the time, each and every day, to spend time in your word, to spend time in your prayer all day long, whether that is a word or a sentence or a longer prayer or just with the way that we are living our lives. Let that be a prayer to you, Father, knowing that you are all-knowing, all powerful and that you are already ahead of us in the future that those things that we are fearing in the future you're already there open arms open wide for us ready to take us in and hold us father we thank you and we praise you and we give all the glory and honor to you in jesus name Thank you, Pastor Jerry. As we come into this time of communion today, I want you to think and remember back about the cross. And a lot of us wear crosses. I see a few of us in here that have them on right now. And this cross is an outward symbol of an inward commitment. But at the same time, as we see the cross, as we're going through struggles in our lives, facing fear, facing troubles, facing evil in the world, and all of a sudden we see the symbol of the cross. It's a reminder that Jesus overcame fear and death on the cross so we don't have to face it alone. It's a constant reminder that God is with us at all times. 
I wear another cross underneath here. It never comes off. Unless I'm having to take x-rays or something like that and they force me to take it off. Other than that, it stays on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's my reminder that God is with me no matter what. No matter where I'm at, no matter what I'm doing, God is there. And I don't have to face anything alone. Our time together here is called communion. And communion is very simply the fact that we bring ourselves together. We're joining together in this act of remembrance. Christ sacrificing himself for us to overcome fear, to overcome death. We are joining together in communion with each other. Communion means we're joining Christ's body and his blood together in an act of remembrance. So as we come into this time of communion today, I want you to think about that. That we are here today joined together as believers in Christ. We're joined together with God in this very room. Because his word tells us that whenever two or more are gathered together in his name, he is here with us. And that's where he is today. Thank you, God, for being with us here today. On the night that he was betrayed, Christ took bread and he broke it. And he said to the disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup. And he filled it and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And the scriptures go on to remind us that uh, Christ said that he will not drink again of that cup until he comes again to take us home with him. And as I said last week in the message, he has gone ahead of us to prepare a way for us, a, to prepare a room for us. And more importantly, to bring us back to be with him again. And so as we take this communion today, I want you to think about that communion, that joining together. I want you to remember that he overcame fear, he overcame death for you and for me and for many. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. So now it's time for prayers for the people. And um, before we get started, I just wanted to thank everyone for praying for my great nephew this week who. Uh, was only two or three weeks old, and he had uh, surgery this week um, to repair some things going on, and I just want to thank you all for your prayers. And he made it through surgery fine, and he's healing, so just keep praying <laughs> that he will heal completely and be done with all this. So, Anyway, is there anyone else that would like prayer this morning? Mm -hmm. I'd like prayers for Steve Sparks, a co-worker who uh, had a failed hernia mesh implant done. He's got to go out and have the surgery redone uh, tomorrow. And uh, he's got to get a new mesh and everything they have to reconstruct. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm hoping he comes through that well. Mm -hmm. uh, prayers for my family. Yeah, for the camp family. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? My arm hurts. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll pray for your arm, John. go into prayer. Father God, we come into your house this morning to praise and honor you, to exalt you above all things. You are mighty in power, slow to anger, and your faithfulness never ends. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, and even though we walk through the valley, we shall not fear the shadow of death, for you walk with us. We are never alone. We thank you, Jesus, that you love us and you hold us up with your righteous right hand. Father God, I lift up Mark's cousin, uh, Steve Kent's family, as he passed away this week. His father, Bob Kent, is on, a dia on dialysis. 
They are facing many trying challenges at this time. I ask for strength, comfort, courage, and peace as they face each new day. Walk beside Bob and his family and walk with Lori and Mark. Hold on to them, Lord Jesus, and place people in their path to encourage and love them through this trying time. Father God, I pray for Steve Sparks, for his new for his surgery that will be coming, for I'm sure he is in a lot of pain, and I just pray that the doctors do their best work on him, Lord God, so that it will not fail again, Lord Jesus. I lift up John for his arm in pain. I lift up Becky. Diane for her carpal tunnel surgery, February 24th. We just pray for the doctors and the nurses, and I pray the Holy Spirit just be in that room, Lord God, and just do a great job and do a miraculous work for Diane. I pray for Carla and Carla's friend John, my husband Steve, and Doug for his pain this week, as they are all facing pain in their bodies, Lord God. And Lord, we don't understand or know why your ways are different and we don't know why we have to live in pain sometimes Lord all we know is in this life we will have trials we will face many challenges I believe it is how we deal with life's challenges that gets us through so today we are thanking you for the trials of this life we thank you for the pain father God for in our weakness you make us strong you shape us to who you want us to be in this life let us be established in Christ so that we will have victory in this life, Lord. Through our trials and pain, we are able to help others that face similar things. And by doing so, we are spreading the love of God. Let us be a, broke, let us be a beacon of light that shines in the darkness, in this dark world. Let us not fall away from you, O oh God. Help us to conquer the pain and the trials of this life that we live. And through prayer and petition and the reading of your perfect word in the Bible, let us stand on your promises, Jesus. Father God, we praise and honor you today for the revival of hearts and minds going on in Asbury University this week. What a great blessing of hope that is being shared with our younger generation. For in this time of great turmoil, you are alive and great miracles are happening in this nation. We are so grateful and so blessed, and we thank you, Jesus, and pray um, for continued re um, reaching of the lost, bring people back into a right relationship with you, Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for all that you're doing. And in Ephesians 3, 20, 21, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. In Jesus' powerful name. out our time this morning with those that are watching online. Uh, again, the music will be posted uh, as a link in, in, the, or in the, the live feed. There's a prayer that Mark and I have been praying for what, a week and a half now? And earlier this week it went out to you all in an email and it's posted on our social medias. And I want you to join me in praying this today. Mark, would you, there's a copy of it on the, the script there, if you could post that in the, the live as well. Lord God in heaven, I pray for you to move against the forces of evil. Lord God, I ask that by your mighty power that you would bind Satan and all of his minions from every aspect of our lives, as well as those of my family and of my church family. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus, bind all the forces of darkness and disband them with your light. Throw the enemy forces into confusion, hampering their plans and shutting down their schemes so that they will not prosper in their rebellion against you and we, your people. 
I pray that any and all support of those who do evil in your sight would be dissolved. I pray that your their hard hearts would be softened and that they would turn to you, Father God, and that they would be made right in your sight through the salvation that comes through accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, let us have eyes to see past the deception of the enemy, and instead of rebellion, there would be repentance. Yes. Draw us ever closer to you, Father. Open our eyes to see that you are the King of kings, the Lord of hosts, the commander of heaven's armies, the most high God. Lord, send your warring and protecting angels to surround us and to protect us from all evil. I pray that all the forces of evil that are working against the efforts of Grace Street Church, of our church family and our friends, would be bound away and that they would be overcome by your mighty power. Lord Jesus, we claim this as a victory in your name, and we know that by calling on your name that you will protect us. All glory, honor, and praise to you forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. And all God's people said,